Well, good morning, church, um, or whatever time you're watching this and joining us. The, the numbers tell me that some of you join us right away Sunday morning at 10, which is uh, what time it is now, and some of you are joining us throughout the week, and we're glad for uh, when and wherever you are uh, joining us this morning. Uh, we want to welcome you, and um, I'm glad that we're going to be able to dig further into our uh, series, Joy in the Darkness, on the book of Philippians this week. We're looking at uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 30, and to do our reading and a prayer this morning, I've asked Jacques and Sandy Drizdell to uh, come join us. So would you guys come on up and read and pray for us today? Good morning. We would like to read to you from Philippians 1. starting at verse 12 to verse 30. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is pro proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Let's pray before the sermon. Paul wrote in this passage, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Lord, allow us to be that message, that one that... Uh, carries your message through this world. We desire to know you more, to know you deeper. And that's why we gather together when we can. And when we can't, 
we take on your message for, to us, like this morning. We care about your uh, advancement in this world. Let us be the hands and the feet that go out and touch the, the people that don't know you and to be the ones that build up others and strengthen them. May your word go out and as you in, enforce your uh, ability to reach out, may you give Pastor Chris the, the knowledge and the ability to reach to our hearts and let us understand what you have for us as a message. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A few years ago, I went, uh, I went fly fishing with another fellow, and, uh, and we waded into this flowing river. There was, it was a be beautiful mountain valley, and we waded into a, a flowing river where he took me. He said there was going to be good trout fishing there, and he was going to teach me how to fly fish. And we went into about thigh deep, sometimes waist deep in this river, and there was, there was good fish in there. And I knew he was going to be a better caster than me because he was experienced. I was a newbie in all this, but what also really surprised me is how he stood solid. In fact, as he's casting, he's saying, Chris, let's just walk upstream and cover some ground while we, while we do this fishing. And I could barely stand in one spot against the current while he's just confidently walking his way upstream. I'm thinking, I should be able to do that. I'm in better shape than that guy. But what was going on under the water is that he was wearing wading shoes, fly fishing shoes that, you know, they had a felt bottom, a little spikes, that would, that would punch right tr through the slime on all the rocks, the slime and the algae that makes those rocks on the river bottom so, so slippery. So while I'm struggling just to maintain my footing and barely inch forward, he's just walking confidently upstream. And it reminds me of Brian Bueller's sermon that we uh, listened to just a couple of weeks ago where he quotes Psalm 73 and said, My feet had almost slipped, I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalmist says, when I saw how good some people have it, and I see how tough my life is, my feet almost slipped. And the reality is that all of us face times in our lives when we are fighting to walk against the current when we feel like everything is coming at us in life and, and, and we're moving upstream instead of going with it. In the faces of, of all that's coming at you, you can feel like you are wading upstream in life. And, and we all face things that, are, that try hard to put pressure on us and knock us down. It, it can be denied goals. It can be unmet expectations. It, it can be the unfairness that you may face at the hands of other people. It can be criticism. It can be being overlooked or, or the fear of an uncertain future. And all of those things are things that Jacques and Sandy just read to us in this passage uh, about Paul's ministry to the Philippians, even while he was writing from a jail cell in Rome or a house where he was imprisoned in Rome. And the question is, how do you respond when you face those currents coming at you? And it is natural, so natural for us to just respond with despair. And uh, it's, it's natural to respond with anger and outrage. It's, it's natural to want to search for some kind of answer. Why is this all happening? It's natural to try to take back control in some way or to just keep hitting refresh in hopes that there will be better news. And that's just me. And that's just this week. <laughs> um, there, there, there's so many things that I, and I tell you every week. I don't have to go looking for something old in the news. Every week brings something new in the news. Everything, every week brings some new story that I hear from other people about what they're facing in life that's trying to knock them down. And it's so easy to respond, so easy to respond with despair or anger or, or, or craving for answers or trying to take back control. It's so easy to be joyful when things are going our way. And when the sun is shining, but when the current is going against you, does a Christian have something more to hang on to? And I want to tell you that Paul shows us how in the passage that Jacques and Sandy just read to us. 
And so I want to talk to you this morning about how to have joy against the current. I'm going to tell you three things that, that won't bring you joy, and then we're going to look at the th kind of things that can bring joy against the current. So the first thing, this is a don't. If you're taking notes, um, don't be a complainer. Remember, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from a place of being imprisoned in Rome. He's waiting on trial for his life. How this trial goes could determine whether he lives or dies. And yet, Paul says, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What? He's, he's on trial for his life, and his big concern is the gospel, the message of the good news of Jesus. He dedicated his life to something bigger than himself. We talked about that last week. He was living for something and someone greater than himself. He was more interested in how he was going to spend his life than he was in how he was going to save his life. Because in Paul's mind, he was already safe. So here he, here he says, against all of the current that's flowing against him in life, he says, my situation has actually served to advance the gospel. And he uses a word there, prokopain is a Greek word that we translate advance. And, and prokopain, actually, it sounds like pain, which might help you remember the word. Prokopain means to make progress against difficulties, against the current. And it was used, just to give you an image of what this word means, this is a word that could be used to describe a piece of metal being beat by a metalsmith how, in the way that he would forge a tool or a blade, a, a chunk of metal that he's beating forward. And, and, and that's what God was doing through Paul's life. He says God is, God is allowing the gospel to be beat forward through my circumstances. It's making progress even in the face of trial and difficulty. Paul felt crushed. He felt beat. He felt stretched. How about you? And yet what he said is, what seems like a setback is actually progress. He wouldn't have known that going in, of course. We rarely do. But Paul's imprisonment was getting the gospel into places it might never have penetrated. In fact, if we flip over to Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts, which describes the early history of the church, it ends with Paul's house arrest in Rome. He's been sent to Rome on trial for his life, and, and the book ends with this statement, for two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So not only this does he say, but in the passage we saw this morning in Philippians, it says that not only was, was he able to preach with boldness, without hindrance to anyone who came to his house to visit him, but other believers saw his courage and they gained courage to share their faith because of Paul's example. What seemed like a setback was actually progress. He was being beat forward to advance the gospel. So I want to tell you this, hard times won't kill your joy. But complaining will kill your joy. And, and, and Paul faced real hardships. I mean, just think about his hardships. He doesn't really go into it there, but he was not free to go where he wanted to go. He had to pay his own expenses. This guy is locked up. He's got guards around him. He can't go to work. And he's got to pay for his own rented house and expenses. You know, other believers, I'm sure, helped support him through that two-year time. But while he waited, he paid his own expenses. And then it says he waited because that two years of being in that house, advancing the gospel, even though he did, were two years he spent waiting while his accusers never showed up. I tell you, I'm a natural complainer. I like to, as, as somebody put it once, I, I like to announce my suffering. Another word for that is grumbling. And we're going to look at that in the passage that's coming next week. But complainers and grumblers love to say, things are not going my way. And instead of being a complainer, Paul chose to look for the good and hang on to his joy. What seemed like a setback was actually progress. So number one, don't be a complainer. Secondly, don't be a critic. 
If you want to hang on to joy against the current, don't be a critic. Paul, um, apparently while he was locked up, some other Christians with less than perfect motives went preaching around the city of Rome, and, and he goes to so far as to say that they were supposing they could stir up trouble for him, as he puts it. Now, these are not false teachers apparently they're teaching the truth about Jesus, but they're taking advantage of the situation to out-preach Paul. And Paul just let it go. He just let it go. And now, I want to say this. When we suffer, it can be really easy to drift into a place of criticism, to, to develop a critical spirit when things are not going the way that we want them to go for us. I can, when I'm suffering, when I'm under pressure, when the current's against me, I can start to nitpick. And the word for critic actually uh, refers to a discerning person, a person who sees things for what they are, like, you know, like a food critic or an art critic or a, a film critic. They, they see things and they, and they tell you what they see. But it's pretty easy for us to go from perceptive to persnickety. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And, and I can go there, where I just start to see flaws in everything and everyone. And I don't know where the line falls between perceptive and persnickety, but I do know that I've crossed it in my life. And I start judging the motives and the methods of everyone. And I know this, that when you start to welcome a critical attitude in your life, it will kill your joy. It will kill the joy in you, and it will kill the joy in everyone around you. And Paul is not blind to the truth. He's not, he's not blind to the truth. He knows what's going on. He's perceptive. It's just that Paul sees further than himself. He's not blind. He's just got a longer vision. And Paul's not a wimp. He's not, you know, a can't we all just get along kind of guy. Truth matters deeply to Paul. In fact, if I could quote him, because uh, one time he got hot and bothered. Um, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, if you wanted to look at that, you would find one time Paul says this. It's shocking compared to him in, in Rome writing to the Philippians saying, you know what, if, if people are preaching Jesus out of false motives, that's okay. What does it matter? But in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Think about what Paul is saying. Literally, he is saying, if someone is not teaching the truth about Jesus, let them go to hell. So when it came to defending truth, Paul's all about that. He could get fully bent out of shape if the truth about Jesus got twisted. But when it came to his reputation, and his prominence as a preacher of that truth, he was willing to let it go. Have you ever considered whatever makes you mad points in the direction of what matters most to you? And I want to ask you a question right now with the things that you are walking through. Whatever, whatever life is throwing at you, whatever current is coming at you and trying to knock you off your feet, are you spending your emotional energy on the right things right now? See, because Paul was deeply concerned for the truth, but he wasn't worried about himself. And he was, he was so confident in God's ability to work that he was, he, was, he was confident that even people's mistakes could be used by God to spread the gospel. Uh, and we actually have to believe this because there's nobody who shares Jesus that does it perfectly. And there's nobody that shares Jesus that does it with perfect motives. We have to believe that God will use imperfect people to get the job done. And Paul's attitude was, look, I've got bigger things to be concerned about than why people are talking about Jesus. As long as people are talking about Jesus and as long as they're telling the truth about Jesus. And so Paul chose not to be a critic and it allowed him to hang on to his joy. So... Don't be a complainer. Don't be a critic. And then thirdly, don't be a coward. Paul, um, Paul says, I, you know, I, I know that through your prayers and God's provision, what's happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I, I, I eagerly expect that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, he says, so that I can exalt Christ in my body, whether by life or death. Paul expected and he hoped, he says, that I will not be ashamed or fearful as he faced a possible death sentence. That tells me that he knew that wimping out was a possibility. It's a possibility for every one of us that at the moment of trial, we may make compromises to save our own skin. I know that's a possibility for me, and Paul knew it was for himself, but he was eager to bring glory to Jesus. Now, he thought he would live, and it's possible that he was actually freed from this imprisonment and had another period of ministry before his final fatal imprisonment in Rome. The Bible actually doesn't tell us conclusively what happened after Acts 28. It is there. And there's some clues that maybe Paul got out and had some more ministry, uh, but we don't know absolutely for sure. And, and I, I think a couple of weeks ago I said that, that Paul uh, died after this imprisonment, and I misspoke when I said that because we don't know. And it's actually okay that we don't know because we don't know how things are going to turn out for us either. It's the, it's the uncertainty that's actually the scary thing. You know, it's what lies in the dark that makes the dark scary. You don't know what's there. And cowards say, I've got to protect my interests. Cowards say, my life is too important to sacrifice. And, and Paul chose not to be a coward. Whether by life or by, by death, I, I just hope that Christ is exalted in my body. I, I hope you notice that all the killers of joy that Paul names and that we see in this passage, all the killers of joy are me-centered attitudes. And I'll, I'll put it this way, living for yourself, whether by being a complainer when you don't get your way, whether by being a critic of other people who might have it easier than you, whether it is by being a coward and, and doing, sacrificing everything but yourself, All of those are me-centered attitude, and living only for yourself will rob you of your joy when life gets hard. And for Paul, you can see it throughout this passage and really throughout the book, everything circles back to this one thing that matters most to him, and that's Jesus. And he says later on in the passage, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. And to die is gain. I want to tell you, Paul had the right yabbat in his life. Have you, ever, have you ever talked to somebody with a bad case of yabbat? <laughs> somebody who, no matter what you say, they've always got a yeah, but, you know, and they contradict whatever it is that you have to say. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody can be a real downer, and you might have good news. It's sunny out, yeah, but, it, it, you know, things are probably going to burn later. <laughs> um. It's always, yeah, but, and nothing is ever good enough, convincing enough. And I can be like that. I can be a, a, a yeah, but kind of guy when I'm selfish or scared or suffering. And Paul had a very different yeah, but. You know, people say, Paul, you've lost your freedom. Yeah, but the gospel is advancing. Paul, you're being upstaged by other preachers. Yeah, but Jesus is getting known. Paul, your future looks really uncertain. Yeah, but I will either serve Jesus or meet Jesus. And Paul saw his life as a win-win situation. Paul knew the truth that we can't be in two places at once. I mean, that's, that's a problem. When, you, you know, when you're fishing in one hole and you see them biting at the other hole, you can't be in... Well, you could try to have two rods set up, but... You can't be in two places at once or as the politicians who were either out of the country or home at Christmas <laughs> had to explain, you can't be in two places at once. So much of life seems like we have to choose between our losses, doesn't it? And the scenarios are, are they're win-lose. And Paul had learned to view living or dying as win-win. He could hang on to joy because he lived for a higher purpose than himself and because his hope rested on Christ. Life is Christ. 
And as much as joy is mentioned in this book, and it is, is why I've titled the series what I have, Christ is mentioned way more than joy. 42 times. For Paul, living or dying is all about Jesus. I can't be in two places at once. And as a, as a limited person on this earth, as someone who, you know, I, I don't have all the strength. I, I can't do everything I want to do. I may not even get to choose which one place I can be in all the time. But I know this. Jesus is with me everywhere. And that's where C.S. Lewis, um, he would circle back to the same truth that Paul is preaching in this passage. And that is that Christ is life. C.S. Lewis wrote this. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. And so, Paul writes, whatever happens, whatever happens, we can't control what life throws our way. We can't control what is coming in the current against us, but we can control the way we respond to it. And so Paul says that the way to respond to the whatever that is coming your way is to live your life, he says, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live your life in a manner worthy of of the good news that Jesus is king. And that means not complaining, not being a critic, not being a coward. And he goes even further and he says, I, I want you to be striving together as one. The implication in Paul's words there and the implication in the fact that he wrote a letter to people is that Christians aren't going to do this alone. You and I will not do this alone. After a, after a big windstorm, you'll, you'll notice sometimes that lots of trees fall down. But somebody pointed out um, some years ago, after a massive windstorm, many trees went down, but here was, here was this stand of aspens. You don't see aspens go down all that often. And, and there's, a, there's a reason for that and, that, and that is that an aspen grove is actually one organism. It's one tree. And they're all interconnected. That root system goes between all the trees. It's not an, a bunch of individually standing trees. They're all connected, and it's really hard to blow them down. Striving, striving together as one. And we need to stay connected. That's really hard right now. We're going to have to work at that but we can do it. It has been granted to you, Paul writes, also to suffer for him. Being a Christian um, doesn't give you a pass, in other words. In fact, sometimes the followers of Jesus Christ will suffer even more because of their faith. Everyone suffers on this earth. The earth has got suffering. It's just a part of life. And Grandma was right when she said, and I quoted Grandma last week too, Grandma was right when she said, life is not fair. Get used to it. And sometimes for followers of Jesus, we suffer even more because we follow Jesus. It's been granted to you to suffer also with, for him. And sometimes you get to choose your suffering. Sometimes you have no choice in your suffering. Let me, let me just get really honest and real with you here for a second. A little, little family talk. Um, this week after the provincial orders were extended, um, our elders met once again, uh, as we do each time, and, uh, and we discussed what to do. And, um, and, there, and there's that question, uh, what, what suffering are we going to choose? Do we suffer by not going to church? Because not being here with each other is a real kind of suffering. It's not fun. It doesn't feel good. Or do we suffer by paying fines and penalties for going to church? And that's a real question that we're dealing with, and different churches have responded in different ways. Uh, wh which one do we choose? And you know what really encouraged me? As the elders sat around the table and conversed, no one, no one said, this is what I want. 
I saw in the elders the character of Jesus and love for Jesus and love for you. They were filled with humility. They were filled with self-sacrifice, filled with servanthood. And you know what their core question was? What will serve the purpose of Christ right now? And we may be wrong. I mean, I have to admit that. We may be wrong in the decision we've made to proceed this way. And honestly, honestly, right now, from our point of view, it looks like a lose-lose situation from a human perspective because we know whatever choice we make, it's going to cost us. But it's actually a win-win because if we're wrong, we welcome God's correction and we've got a chance to grow even deeper in our dependence on Jesus. And if we're right, well, people will see Jesus. I tell you what, something is going to take you out in the end. Go down serving Jesus. The first and core question to ask when you are grappling with tough issues, and, and I don't know what your issues are, but I know that everyone who is hearing this is grappling with tough issues, or will be. The first and core questions is what will serve to advance the name of Jesus? Not what do I want. What will advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would we ask that question? Well, because he's already suffered for you. I'm going to end, um, I'm going to end with 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. I'm just going to read this for you because it, it speaks to people who are suffering for Jesus. For people who are walking against the current in life. And here's what it says. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. And how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, that is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So as we close, I want to lead us in a, a little faith exercise here. An exercise to, to put to work in our lives what we've just been hearing. And I want to ask you to just bow your head in prayer and in quietness before the Lord. Would you ask Jesus, Lord, in my life, where do I drift toward complaining? In my life, where do I drift toward a critical attitude toward others? In my life, where do I drift toward holding back in fear? And just name those to the Lord. And then ask, Lord, where am I inclined to elevate my preferences, my comforts, my reputation, and my rights ahead of the gospel, ahead of you? And confess those things to him. And then can we pray? Lord Jesus, although I often want to drift with the me first current that is all around me, and though standing in that stream to serve you is difficult, I do stand in the confident belief that you are enough, that you see farther upstream, that your purposes are greater and that you already suffered, not for your mistakes,
but for my sins. You didn't threaten. You didn't retaliate. You trusted your father for the outcome. And what looked like a setback was actually progress. As you, Lord Jesus, allowed yourself to be beaten and pierced to become the instrument of my salvation. Now make me an instrument of your message. Amen. So friends, reality is difficult, and it is often not fair, but your reality is not as big as your Savior. Rejoice. God bless you.